Okay, Assalamu alaikum. First of all, um, Assalamu alaikum, brothers and sisters. We welcome you to Masjid Aqsa, and this event is by ISGH and Masjid Aqsa. We will start this event by the Quran recitation. I will invite Muhammad Abdul Karim to come over here and recite Surah Doha. Assalamu alaikum. A'uzu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wadduha wal-layli idha saja. Ma wadda'aka rabbuka wa ma qala. Wala al-akhiratu khayrun laka min al-ula. وَلَسَوْفَ يُعْتِيكَ رَبُّكَ فَتَرْضَى أَلَمْ يَجِدَكَ يَتِيمًا فَآوَى وَوَجَدَكَ ضَالًا فَحَدَى وَوَجَدَكَ وجدك عائلا فأغنى فأما اليتيم فلا تقهر وأما السائل فلا تنهر وأما بنعمة ربك فحده صدق الله العظيم I chose this surah because when the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was sad, um, the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this surah to comfort him. Jazakallah khair. Thank you so much, Abdul Karim. Jazakumullah khair. Okay, I would like to introduce our, our respected speakers for tonight. I have Rabab Ahmed. She is a graduate of Baylor Psychiatry Program. Um, she is a consultant psychiatry health link now, formerly assistant professor at the Baylor College of Medicine. Her area of practice is emergency psychiatry. And we have Sister Nusrat Khan. She is uh, graduating from master. Uh, she will be graduating from her master's program at Lamar University in couples counseling in December 22. Okay, inshallah. So let's just go. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm gonna, we are both actually kind of sharing this um, presentation together. So I'm going to stand in middle so that I can uh, justify my audience. So my name is Nuzhat and I have been a teacher for about 25 years and then I uh, wanted to transition into counseling because I have been a high school teacher, a middle school teacher and an elementary teacher and I kind of realized the community and the society in general needs a lot of uh, help when it comes to mental health counseling. So that was my incentive for um, just transitioning into a different career. So Dr. Rizvi, you can introduce yourself. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and um, talk about uh, anxiety today. That's the topic that we have chosen. So with a show of hands, has anyone in this room has ever been in a car accident? Okay, a couple of ladies here on this side. So it seems on the guy's side, no one has yet um, had that opportunity. So I'll tell you, I'll share a little story with you that I was once in a car accident and I was going to work as a teacher. I go early in the morning and I was hit on the passenger side and my car was totally wrecked. 
uh, the airbag was deployed, and um, I was fully conscious. I was able to take off my seat belt, stand on the side of the road, and wait with the, for the, uh, somebody to come or help to arrive. So what I did in that time of uh, shock was my flight and fight response. And that is something that we had evolutionary and as hunters and gatherers from uh, thousands of years when we were actually, we had to protect ourselves from the animals. So that's the time in the case of any fear, your uh, fight and flight uh, response takes over and um, you, your brain actually thinks faster than what you can do right now. And those of us who are mothers here, anytime your child is falling, before you know it, your hands are out there to grab them. So that's like it's a system in our brain that kicks all the systems away and moves forward to take over. Now, this response is actually really good when we are faced with real danger. But when there is no real danger and you are, you are your body is actually kicking this uh, cortisol and adrenaline into you for three days, four days, or in sometimes over a month, that is where you, we call that anxiety, and the anxiety actually transforms uh, into other uh, um, mental disorders like depression, schizophrenia, and psychosis. Um, so let me see if I, so some of that is also like your panic attacks also when you see that you're flooded, your heartbeat is racing and uh, you get sweaty palms, that those are called panic attacks. So these are all precursors of anxiety, yeah. So what, what contributes to anxiety? So all of us have anxiety and anxiety is kind of really good because it protects us from danger. And, but the thing is that sometimes anxiety just takes over our mind and we stay anxious for a long duration of time and that's when the damage happens. Um, so a lot of situations, you will see that, for example, if somebody gets a, fails a test, there will be different people reacting to it differently. Some of them will take that as a failure for life and they will say, I can never do anything right. I will never be able to go to college. Uh, or as a mom, you will say, oh, I'm a bad mother because my child failed in this test. So we have all these thoughts. These are what we call in psychology stories that we tell our mind, which are not true because they are not based on any evidence because it doesn't make us a bad mother or a father if your child gets, uh, fails one test or you yourself encounter a problem at work, but it doesn't make, it makes you a bad person or bad worker, but it's just that your anxiety makes you feel that way. And sometimes it could be a childhood trauma, where if you were abused sexually or physically, uh, then any danger you perceive, it takes you back into that traumatic situation. Next. So these are all the kinds of um, anxiety disorders that I have listed up here. Uh, the first one is called all or nothing thinking in which we are always, we want to be the perfectionist. We want to do everything perfect. Um, black and white thinking, there is no gray area. We always want things to be either black or white. Labeling, when we tell ourselves that I'm a bad mother, I'm a bad student, I'm a bad worker, we take it inwardly or we label other people and we say, this thing happened to me because of my boss, my boss is mean, or uh, my family, if you have a conflict with family member, you label them that they are mean people who are doing this to me. Uh, mind reading is also when, uh, like in Urdu, we say, log kya kahenge, like you're always concerned about what other people are thinking about who you are as a person and who your family is. Fortune telling is also when you predict future, which is not true. You failed a test, you're like, okay, I will be a failure. I will not be able to go to college. My, I'm a failure as a mother. So we are predicting future, whereas there is no evidence that it's going to happen that way. Catastrophizing is also when we think of the extreme scenarios all the time because we think uh, my 
daughter if she leaves home and I don't hear from her I'm like oh she had an accident she's in a ditch somewhere so I start calling everybody else so I exaggerate the situation that is catastrophizing then unreal ideals which happens a lot in our culture where we always dream and want to have somebody else's life where we'll say oh their kids and that family they are such good Muslims. They pray all the time, and my kids don't do that. So I am a bad mother. We are not good parents. So that is the kind of distorted thinking that we tell ourselves, and we become anxious. Then we get mad at the kids, and the kids get anxious. So it's like a negative feedback loop in the entire family. Emotional reasoning. It's the same thing as we said, as I said earlier also, that something happens and you personalize it and you say, I am responsible for that. I made it happen. I wish I hadn't done that. What if it hadn't, done, if it hadn't happened to me? I should have uh, chosen a different path. I should have done things differently. So all these should haves, could haves, what if scenarios are the one that is causing the anxiety uh, to you. Mental filtering, that is another one of very specific to our Desi culture where if somebody gives you a compliment, we don't acknowledge it. They say, you're looking nice. You are like, oh, you're so kind. Instead of saying thank you, we underplay that. But if they say, oh, you put on a couple of pounds, and we're like, oh my god. And I take it to my heart, and I stop eating immediately. So those are the things that we are not kind to ourselves. We, if somebody says something, Negative, we take it to our heart, we take it too seriously. If they say something positively, we underplay that. Um, then personalization is again the same as when we say your child gets a bad um, grade in a report card, and you, or if they don't pray five times a day, you reflect, you think of that as if it's your fault. Next. Um, so how can we combat anxiety? So the first thing is that you have to be very mindful of your situation. If you are someplace, you have to recognize that this is what my mind is doing to you. Because we have done it for such a long time, it's not only cultural, it happens only in our culture, it happens across the board in all cultures. Because we have certain gender roles, we have certain expectations of our kids, and when they are not met, we start becoming anxious about it. We make everybody else around us anxious. So if we recognize them, then we can stop and reframe our thinking and say, OK, this is not true. There is no evidence of that, that my child is always going to be a failure. There will be a change. If I lost a job, I can get a new job. If I got a bad appraisal, I can make up for that next year. So you know, this is how we reframe our thinking. And then if none of that is helping, please seek help. Next, yeah. So I also would be quickly skim through the types of uh, anxiety. So the first one is selective mutism. Uh, we know a lot of our kids are very, sometimes kids are very shy and they choose where they want to talk and where they want to be quiet. And we, as coming from a culture where we want our kids to be very confident and go out and give presentations, and if they are very quiet in front of people, we try to push them and we blame them and we say, why don't you talk? Go and talk and go say salam to everybody. Go shake hands. So we push them. That is never helpful. And um, so at times, Kids choose that as a coping mechanism because it could be that they have social anxiety and which is developmental and it can, it can improve as they become teenagers or step into their adult life or it may not. But that is something that we have to help them get over with. Uh, the second one is phobias. Phobias are pretty common also like a lot of us in Desi women I think people have this uh, fear of lizards cockroaches. So those are phobias that you just can't stand them. You get certain sensations on your body and they cause you anxiety. So uh, many women don't want to go outside and work in the yard because of the lizards. So, so, so such phobias are real. Some people have phobias of the heights, closed spaces. Um, there is another one 
uh, you can go to the next one. There's another one which is agro, okay, this one is social anxiety where there are some people, if they have to go to a dinner party or come to a mosque, they will take longer to get ready, and that is their social anxiety delaying them. So they have anxiety of new situations where they have to go and talk to people. If you, if mosque is your home and you come here every day, you probably won't have it coming to the mosque. But anytime you have to go to an, an unfamiliar place, you, your social anxiety will kick in, which is pretty normal. For many people it happens, but if it gets out of proportion and you get flooded and your heartbeat is racing and you're sweaty, um, that's when you can say, okay, yes, I have the anxiety problem. Panic disorders are pretty common because of any anxiety. For example, as, as I mentioned, phobia. So if actually you see a lizard, and if you have a phobia from lizards, your heart will be racing and you will be flooded. Uh, agoraphobia is the one in which uh, it's a fear of open spaces, like taking public uh, transportation. Well, now with COVID, I think everybody's scared of uh, public transportation, but agoraphobia is people just cannot go out in open spaces. And then I have generalized anxiety disorder, which is uh, mostly based on school performances. Teenagers go through it a lot where they, have, they know that there's pressure at home of being successful in school. And uh, they are unable to keep up with that, with academic pressures. So they, have, they live under constant anxiety. So we as a, parents need to recognize that and sometimes if you have a job that you don't like, but you have to go there anyways, you are under constant anxiety at work. Is it one more? And you know, and I was looking and researching into, actually uh, this one I found, I went to a Muslim um, Health Council last year, uh, sorry, Muslim Health Conference in Houston. And there this uh, one uh, renowned Muslim, um, psychologist actually shared uh, Surah Nas, which all of us know. And in Quran, many, on many places, they mention waswasa. And in this surah also, it says, min shar al wasil khannas, allazi yuwaswiso fi sadurin nas, that Allah save me from the evil thoughts. So evil thoughts in this context is your anxiety, your paranoia, your phobias, all these things that your brain is telling you, which in fact, they're not true. So, so Islam is the actually first one. We find a lot of traditions, a lot of scholars in the beginning of the Muslim era had been researching about mental health and making people aware of that. So that comes to, I think, the end of my part of the uh, presentation. Uh, you guys have uh, cards on both sides. If you have any questions, you can write. And if you come across any future topics that you want us to talk about, we can do that. Thank you, Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Um, my name is Rabab Rizvi, and I'm a psychiatrist. Um, I am really glad that Sumaya asked us to talk about anxiety. And um, I'll tell you why. So I, after graduating from Baylor Psychiatry Program, I worked on the inpatient unit at the VA hospital, and then since the last 10 years, I've been doing emergency psychiatry. So I see the most acute, most intense kind of psychiatric issues. Um, the reason it's so important to talk about anxiety disorders is because first of all, it's the most prevalent form of disorders, of any psychiatric disorders. More women than men suffer from it, but it could be possibly because more women tend to seek help for mental health, so that could be it. It starts at an early age as compared to other psychiatric disorders, and that is why early intervention is the key. It has to be dealt with as soon as possible. There is high rate of somatization, and I'll tell you what that means. So, you know, especially culturally also, what we see quite often is that, um, you know, the headaches that don't go away, the backache that doesn't go away, the muscle tension that doesn't go away, it could be because of anxiety rather than having a physical cause for it. So we need to be aware about it. Culturally, because 
that could be a more socially acceptable way for expressing that. Because in our culture, it can be easier to say, I have a headache, I have a backache, as compared to I'm not feeling well, I'm feeling very anxious. So we need to be more open about it. Now, other thing is, there's not enough of us. So 80% of people with panic disorders, they're going to be seen by their prime care physicians. And, and we have one sitting right here, Dr. Noreen Pirzada, so it, and she, she knows, she deals with it. And cardiologists will frequently be involved. So the prime care physicians have to be the gatekeeper, and they have to be aware how to deal with it. I, I really don't see too many people with anxiety. I mean, I'm the last person they'll be seeing. And when um, the prime care physicians see them, they need to do a complete workup. And unfortunately, panic disorders in particular, they are underdiagnosed, they are undertreated, and uh, worse than that, not treated at all. So that's definitely an issue that we see frequently. Next slide. I, I do want to briefly talk about what are the causes for anxiety. Uh, Nuza touched on what are the types of anxiety. I want to talk about the causes. There can be pre genetic predisposition, so that means there's a strong tendency for anxiety disorders to run into families, even with something like PTSD. Kind of research your system, and because you know there's, uh, there's uh, this field epigenetics, that it's a two-way traffic. The way we react to our environment and whatever stressors we have, that affects our genes. Just like we have risk for diabetes and high cholesterol, so similarly it can run in families. Uh, medical disorders, so people with things like mitral valve prolapse, um, hyperthyroidism, they can present with anxiety symptoms, and it's very important to keep that in mind. So especially when there's a workup, um, so when, when somebody presents to the ER for the first time, of course the ER physician is going to be looking at their age, their medical risk, and they may do an EKG, they may do even a CD scan to rule out pulmonary embolism, that's a clot in the lung. And so um, the whole electrolytes, everything. So um, it really depends. You really have to see who's presenting and what risk factors they have and investigate it accordingly. Anxiety, now we have anxiety disorders and it is a very common symptom when it presents with depression, with schizophrenia. It can even present with substance use disorders. I worry more about those patients when I see them because their risk for suicide can be higher. So what I'm trying to say here is that it's more like an umbrella. It can be a symptom of another disorder or it can be a primary disorder by itself. Next slide, please. So limbic alert. What is a limbic alert? We scan our environment, right? So. Um, if I'm standing here and I'm, a, a lot of, how many people have fear of public speaking? So none of the men have that fear, okay. The women say they do, all right. So, so what is that? Uh, so we, when we have our fight or flight response, we're just pre preparing our body for action, right? I mean, if I don't do a good job here, you guys are a nice audience, you're not going to kill me, right? But still, I can just, perceive that and like my heart can be beating fast, I can be breathing more. It's a very common fear. So uh, what, just briefly, for those of you who are more technical and interested, uh, there's an area in our brain, amygdala, that controls the fear response. So you, the amygdala becomes very active with a perceived threat, which may not be real, that's the key. So uh, in anxiety disorders, the response is disproportionate to what is happening. Uh, there's another portion in the brain called the locus ceruleus that releases norepinephrine, and what is that? That is a stress hormone, that is a neurotransmitter, so your body is pumped up for action. We may need it some of the time, we don't need it all the time. That's the thing. So the body overreacts. The, the key message also here is that it is, everybody has anxiety. It is a normal emotion. It's only when it gets out of control that we become dysfunctional, that's when it needs to be treated. And um, another thing I'm thinking about is about panic disorders, what I want to clarify is that 
Um, so we used to tell patients, breathe in a paper bag. And again, for those of you who are more technical, I'll tell you why. What happens is when somebody has a panic attack, they're breathing very rapidly, rapid shallow breaths. They blow off a lot of carbon dioxide, and that affects the level of ionic calcium in our body. And because of that, then they start feeling that tingling sensation. Um, they can have cramping, and then they become more tense. So, and that's why we used to tell them, okay, breathe in a paper bag. We don't tell patients that anymore because then they become dependent on it. A lot of people then start carrying that bag everywhere with them. What we now tell them is try to learn how to control your breathing, just the breathing exercises. Uh, like do the exercises even prophylactically, which would mean like even when you're not feeling anxious, just learn to do those exercises a couple of times a day. Okay, so make anxiety your friend. And what do I mean by that? So um, Sumaya so wanted us to focus on back to school anxiety and I think that's very important to talk about. And, and what I mean is research has shown that parents who are able to reframe anxiety symptoms for their kids, those kids have better academic performance. We need to tell our kids, if you're anxious about it, that means this thing is important. How can you make this work for you? How can you let this anxiety stimulate you, stimulate you to do better while keeping it under control? That's the key. And as parents, we have to model it for them. We have to first learn how to contain our own anxiety. And it's a, even I'm a work in progress. I mean, I have two high schoolers, and um, there are times where I feel like banging my head against the wall. Because, you know, we worry about our kids. We want them to do well. We don't like them to make mistakes. So this is how you learn to make anxiety your friend. The example I give to my kids pretty often is, it's like holding a bird in your hand. If you're going to hold it too tight, you're going to kill the bird. But if you are holding it very loosely, the bird's going, going to fly away. And my, my two kids are here, they both play tennis, and, and, and they can tell you, so you know, when you're gripping the tennis racket, if you grip it too tight, what's going to happen? Your arm is going to be rigid, you cannot really hit the ball. And if you're holding it too loose, the racket is going to fly away. So it has to be just right. Next, please. I do want to talk about the role of medications. Uh, and I want to clear some misconceptions here. Uh, I think most of you are probably familiar with benzodiazepines. You may have heard the name Xanax, lorazepam, which is Erivan. Probably everybody has heard the name Xanax. So now, uh, Benzodiazepines are the only class of medications that we use that can be addictive. Antidepressants are not addic addictive, antipsychotics are not addictive. I just want to clarify that. People may need it throughout their life, but they're not addictive. For benzodiazepines, you can have short-acting medications and long-acting. So Xanax is more of a short-acting medication. I prefer not to use it very much, actually. Clonazepam is more of a long-acting one. Is, think about it this way, it's like benzodiazepines are like steroid, good for you in the short term. We try not to have people on it long term. Or even if they need it long term, I would never prescribe anyone just benzodiazepines. Because I would use benzodiazepines just to tide them over till the other medication starts working, like an antidepressant. So antidepressants are also frequently used for treatment of anxiety. Because antidepressants are targeting the underlying cause of it making sh uh, sure that the serotonin level is high enough in the brain. So benzodiazepines are more of a bridge till we get to that point where the other medication is kicking in. Uh, beta blockers, probably everybody is familiar with propanolol. A lot of patients who have uh, heart issues, they take it. So what, uh, they can play a role. Uh, so uh, if somebody has somatic anxiety, uh, public speaking, propanolol can be prescribed. That can also help. Um, one, another thing I want to mention about benzodiazepines that I just remembered is um, for PTSD, which we all know um, is a heightened alert response, people have a lot of anxiety symptoms in PTSD, benzodiazepines long term have not proven to be effective for it. What helps is therapy, what helps is antidepressants. So I just want to make sure that people know about that. 
Another thing, Xanax, clonazepam, it's not a sleep aid. A lot of people use it to help them sleep, not a good idea. Next, please. I cannot emphasize this enough, role of nutrition. And um, especially for our kids, not only for ourselves, because you know, especially when kids become teenagers, what do they do? They want to go out, eat out with their friend, and they eat junk, don't they? Um, so when you eat more processed food, when you drink more carbonated drinks, the simple um, glucose, uh, you get a sugar spike in your body, and then you come crashing down. What happens is then your cortisol level goes up, which is a stress hormone, and that leads to more anxiety. Another thing while talking about nutrition I want to mention is these five, ener five hour energy drinks, these uh, Red Bull, they scare me, especially for teenagers, and not just for anxiety, even for their heart health, their cardiac health. Not a good idea. So we need to talk to our kids that they need to make better choices. If they want to go out with their friends, maybe instead of a soda, they can, smoothie may not be a perfect idea, but still, can you choose something with low calories in it? Can you choose something which is baked instead of um, deep fried? So making sure we have complex carbohydrates in our diet. We need to be mindful of that, and that really helps. Um, we are what we eat, actually. And the other thing I want to talk about is exercise. So, so how many of you do hardcore exercise? Awesome. So good. So we have some people who do that. So you know, so for those of you who do that hardcore exercise, what happens during it? Your heart is beating fast. You're breathing fast. Um, but then you learn to control it. So it's not just the physical benefits. What you're doing is you're mimicking anxiety symptoms, like what happens in a panic attack, in a very safe way. And then when you learn to control your breathing, when you're cooling off, you learn how to deal with those anxiety symptoms. Exercise is that important that for mild to moderate depression, exercise is actually a better treatment than antidepressants. So I cannot emphasize that enough. We, and not, we, it shouldn't be that we just tell our kids, go and play out. Again, we have to model it. So even for the moms, I know you are all very busy, but if we don't, we have to set an example. If we do it, they'll also do it. Next, please. So some tips for back to school anxiety. Uh, our kids are already back in school, uh, but especially for elementary age children and middle school children, what can help with anxiety? So how many, how many parents think that their kids had a lot of too much anxiety about going back to school? Uh, at least some of us, right? So what can help with that? First of all, setting a good, just common sense thing, setting a good bedtime routine, not coming from an overseas flight the day before school starts and the kids are jet lagged. So at least one to two weeks before, make sure you have the same routine. If the kids are anxious, you can take them to school, drive a couple of times, like this is where I will drop you, this is where I'll pick up. Um, setting up a few play dates so they have some familiar faces. Just talking about it at home. If, however, we also need to learn when to seek help. So if it's been like more than a month, there's nothing is working, maybe involve the cool school counselors, they can also guide. So some kids do need more interventions and that's okay. For the teenagers, they have a lot of pressure. In fact, nowadays, the rate of depression and anxiety is shooting up in our kids. And there's a reason for this, because there's so much pressure to perform their test every week, and everything is so competitive. They need to sleep. The teenage brain needs sleep more than elementary school kids. And, and, and the problem is that their circadian rhythm is this way that they want to sleep later. So this is something we need to talk to them about it, not like scolding them, but we need to talk to them about it. I mean, I tell my kids that, you know, if you stay up late one day, that's fine, but otherwise I tell them, you know, it's more important to sleep properly than studying more. You will probably will perform better on your test even with less study if you get enough hours of sleep. Next, please. So I just wanted to talk about some myths versus facts. So the first one is anxiety is not a real illness. 
it is very much a real illness. And um, it can cause severe impairment. The second one is anxiety is rare. Not true. Nearly one in five people have some sort of anxiety disorder. And Nusa talked about different types of, it could be a phobia, it could be generalized anxiety disorder is pretty common, progressively gets worse. So it is, anxiety and stress is something that happens to all of us. All of us. It's just the proportion when, uh, but you know, if it's causing impairment, then you need treatment. This is a very common misconception that anxiety will go away on its own. That does not happen. So again, the imp most important thing is first recognizing the problem, acknowledging the problem. That's very important because you know that's more than 50% of the battle, just admitting, okay, I have this issue and I need help for this. A panic attack, and then some people think that a panic attack can make you pass out. A panic attack is not going to kill you. Again, a panic attack will not kill you. It feels like it, but it will not kill you. Only thing that will make you pass out is if you have low blood pressure. In fact, in a panic attack, your blood pressure is high. So once you have that knowledge, you can deal with it. Okay, people with anxiety should avoid stressful situations. What's going to happen if we advise that, right? If we tell actors, okay, you can stay at home, don't do this. I mean, of course we have to balance it out if they are struggling in some subjects, like do you want to drop to this? But if we just tell them, take it easy, no worries, what will happen? That's, the, that's what they'll learn and that's not real life, right? Um, it is, real life is stressful, it's becoming more stressful and we all have to deal with it. We have to learn how to cope with it. And then uh, therapy for anxiety will take years. That's a very common misconception. Uh, I'm a big fan of cognitive behavior therapy, and that usually takes eight to 12 weeks. It's very targeted, it's very focused, and particularly for anxiety disorders, we see very good results with therapy. And one thing I do want to mention here is that it doesn't have to be either or. A lot of people tell me that I'll try therapy or I'll try medication, and I ask them why not both? Like when somebody is diabetic, we don't tell them, okay, go eat pizza and drink soda every day and then take insulin. We tell them, you have to manage your diet, you have to do this and you have to, so uh, it's not, it's therapy and medication can go hand in hand. There's no, uh, it doesn't have to be, you have to choose one. It depends on what you need at that time. I want to end with um, this hadith, which was narrated by Abu Huraira. So um, our Prophet said that make use of medical treatment for Allah has not made a disease without appointing a remedy for it, with the exception of one disease, namely old age. The reason I'm, I wanted to talk about this hadith is because um, it's a common misconception, especially for mental health disorders, that you know, if somebody has anxiety symptoms, if somebody has depression, people start feeling like they're not a good Muslim. Again, there can be medical causes for it. You can have a genetic predisposition, just like any other disorder. So, and there are treatments out there. I cannot emphasize that enough. Anxiety disorders are very treatable. So uh, if, you, if you take nothing away from this talk but that, I think then we have done our job. I think this was my last slide. We wanted to leave a lot of time for questions since we have to finish in about 10 minutes. So um, you guys can give the cards back or if you want to ask a question. Nusa, do you want to stand up too so yeah, both sure. of us can respond? Sure. From the ladies' side, do you guys have any questions? Thank you. Okay, um, do you want me to read it and then uh, you, can, you want to get your mic? So the first question is, is the only way to control anxiety is to go on medication or are there other natural ways to control it? Um, I think, I, so again, there are lots of ways. I talked about exercise, I talked about nutrition, therapy. Uh, medication comes in 
none of that is working. And again, like I said, we can still do a combination. You want to add to that? Yeah, I'll add to that, that anxiety, um, like, like from to start with, if you are starting, therapy is the first thing to do. If the therapy is not helping, then you can go on medication. Because anxiety is something that you can treat very well with um, therapy. Because, you know, as I said, as she used the word cognitive behavior therapy, so it's a lot of reframing of the thoughts and trying to understand the root of the phobia or the fear or the anxiety. Actually, you answered the next question, which okay. was <laughs> cognitive therapy. Um, the next one is difference between a psychiatrist and a psychologist. Um, so I'll tell you what I do. So psychiatrists go to medical school. They do their four-year residency. Um, so psychiatrists are the ones who prescribe medications. Psychologists and psychiatrists work very clear, um, closely, and you can tell them what a psychologist Yeah, so what uh, the therapist does is that we actually have like that one hour session and we uh it's called a bio psychosocial that we look at your childhood um your uh, biological problems because a lot of that could be related with your biological issues also and um so we cannot prescribe medication but during my course of study i have to know all the medications that she's been talking about, like what is their, the cocktail of medications, what side effects they can have, because when I have clients who come to me uh, on certain medications, I should know what side effects they are facing, and then I can talk to the psychiatrist and kind of uh, uh, play around with the dosage to get the best results. Okay, next question, how to contact you both to get some sessions? Uh, you don't want to see me because, like I said, I work at, at the PR, so I see very intense. I'll, I'll <laughs> I, I don't have my private practice, so um, yeah, I have. Um, so if I ever set up my private practice, then probably yes, but not yeah. at this time. You can see me definitely, and uh, I will leave my phone number here. Uh, the only thing I want to clarify is that I am not a full therapist yet but I am legally allowed to see clients because I am supervised by the site. So there is a site which I work with, it's called Hope and Harmony. So you, but I am leaving my number with you, so if you talk to me and I can get you an appointment with them also. Okay, next question, how to avoid medicines? Um, so usually people who ask this question usually need medications. <laughs> the, 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 what I'm trying to get to is that there's no, there's no harm in medications, right? Because you, your, your psychiatrist, your prime care physician can work with you. Like I said, benzodiazepines are the only class of medications that are addictive. The antidepressants usually have uh, very manageable side effects if they do. So the treatment for anxiety, overall the medications are quite safe. And um, again, um, Yes, we also like to avoid medication. I'm not a big fan of medicines, I'm saying that. Uh, that's my bread and butter, but um, like I said, exercise works, nutrition works, but sometimes we still need that. So again, like with any other disorder, like if somebody's diabetic, if they need insulin, then they need it. They have to do everything, but need that in addition. And I'll add to that, that you know, come for therapy. If you come for therapy first, then we determine because you rule out if you need medication or not because you know medication means that you have you are unable to keep yourself safe you have suicidal ideation you have homicidal ideation you want to harm other people you're self-harming so those are the situations then we have to kind of relax that and start with antidepressants but there's, these are not like long-term medications that you have to take them forever. As soon as you stabilize yourself, you can kind of, you know, talk to her and then kind of manage them. I would them say it depends. That. Yeah, there depends on each situation. There will be some people who need it all their life, some people who need it short term. So it really depends. And like she said, it's about the level of impairment too. So yeah. when, uh, the more the level of impairment is, the more aggressive we are going to be in our treatment. And you know, with teenagers, I will say this, that, that this is where we as parents need to be very careful that we are not kind of dialing up their anxiety by putting pressure on them. And if they have anxiety, like I have a lot of teenage clients. So if, you, if your teenager has anxiety, get them help. 
because you want to nip it in the bud right, right. now before it becomes a depression or borderline personality. And another thing I want to add, which may not be exactly related, is that shaming our child will not lead to behavior change. We need 